And that's why people are so desperate to have Trump elected. They want a savior who's going to save us so they don't have to prepare. But let me tell you, there's no safety, not even Donald Trump. He wasn't able to drain the swamp. He doesn't know conspiracy. He won't be able to drain the swamp the next time, even if he gets elected. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for February 12th through February 19th, 2024, while supplies last. First, we feature backdated one ounce silver philharmonics at $3.15 over spot with a minimum order of 50. We also have pre-1933 gold $10 and $20 liberties at $99 over melt and $145 over melt respectively. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And with us today, a good friend of the show, Joel Skousen, uh, the editor of the World Affairs Brief, and also the author of the book, uh, Strategic Relocation. Uh, Joel, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, good to be with you for the first time, Elijah. Yeah, well, it's great to have you. My father, Dunnigan, has interviewed you quite a lot on the channel, uh, but it's our first time you and I talking here, so it's great to meet you here. I did want to discuss uh, some updates since you last had a conversation on this channel. Um, There's been a lot of geopolitical turmoil, obviously, the Ukraine-Russia war and also the Israel-Hamas war. Do you want to give us kind of a broad overview of what's going on and how is it going to be impacting us over in the U.S.? Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, The important thing to remember here about this Ukraine uh, war is that generally conservatives are resistant to anything the establishment deep state or Democrats are pushing relative to war, especially after the what I call the phony war on terror, where the deep state engineered the 9-11 crisis in order to create a, a war on terror, justifying their intervention in Iraq and Afghanistan, which, by the way, had nothing to do with 9-11. Still, conservatives tend to believe now, as well as my good friend Ron Paul, that uh, if the globalists are against someone based on the phony war on terror, they must be the good guys, or they must at least not be guilty. And so, unfortunately, the libertarians on the side of Ron Paul and LewRockwell.com tend to believe that there aren't any enemies other than our own globalist deep state, that Russia and China really aren't enemies, that they would get along fine with us, despite the fact that they're communist and that the, as I pointed out in the World Affairs Briefs, that the Soviets engineered their own collapse in order to gain aid and trade and to basically... They were losing the arms race with the United States and economically as well and wanted to catch up. And so they faked their own collapse. It wasn't spontaneous. Uh, Stasi and East Germany were told to stand down. The KGB and Russia were told to stand down and let the protests go forward. So that the West would think that Russia was now defanged and that they could give aid and trade in the U.S. West did. But, you know, conservatives, and especially Tucker Carlson in his latest interview with uh, Putin, uh, has a severe lack of understanding of the uh, real history of conspiratorial action that would have um, helped him understand the deception that he was going to be fed by by Putin. But going back to the globalist, and I'm not defending our own globalist government in criticizing Tucker Carlson here. They are just as evil as the Chinese and the Russians. All three are really predator states trying to gain control over a a new world order. But conservatives fail to understand that the globalists have been building both Russia and China as enemies uh, since their very inception. In 1917, uh, capitalists from Wall Street, Jacob Schiff, gave $20 million in gold to the uh, Russian emissary in the United States who got arrested in Canada with all that gold. The Canadians wanted to confiscate it. The White House called the Canadians and told them to give it back to Trotsky, Leon Trotsky, and let him take it to Russia. The Britons, the Brits gave an equal amount of $20 million in gold to the Bolsheviks to fund the revolution. Now, that isn't talked about in normal history, but that's the fact uh, that 
capitalists. You know, when I, why would the capitalists be building an enemy? Well, this is a long-term agenda of the Hegelian dialect creating conflict, war and conflict, so that you can justify getting Americans to do something they wouldn't otherwise do. And in this case, you see, the globalists have always wanted a, a new world order or a global government. And so one of the purposes of fomenting World War I, uh, there were various purposes, one of them was to get us into a global government, which was the League of Nations, and that failed. But they did make the treaty, the Versailles Treaty uh, provision so onerous that it guaranteed that Germany would come again and fight against the West out of the injustice of all those, those demands. And so World War II got us uh, the United Nations, but it had no teeth. It's got no military power to speak of, a uh, few peacekeeping troops, no taxing power, no regulatory power like the EU. And so the globalists need one more war to actually get Americans to finally give up their national sovereignty. And people like uh, Mr. Gardner and the Council on Foreign Relations openly talked about this. By hook or by crook, we're going to get rid of American sovereignty to talk them into a new world order. And they need a third world war to do that. COVID didn't do it, even though that was a conspiracy of, uh, of a huge proportion, taking away much of our liberty. Uh, but it really is going to take a war to do that. And so what conservatives don't understand by not, and excuse me for going through this, a little bit of this history, but conservatives don't understand this history and the fact that the globalists, as evil they are, as they are in bringing and funding our enemies and giving them trade and technology, have to switch sides before the war starts so they don't get blamed for it. And that's what we're seeing in the war with Ukraine. Now, it actually started a little bit early because Donald Trump got elected where they didn't expect it, but Trump won. And so they pulled out the Russia card about Russian interference, which was a total fraud, in order to vilify Trump. And that turned out to be a fraud. But they have kept on that anti-Russian thing. Now, remember, before this time, they covered for the Soviet Union. Uh, they allowed them to invade Cuba and Nicaragua with uh, communists and Venezuela without raising a peep about it. They were covering for the Soviet Union until the end when they have to start attacking Russia. Because when this war starts, they don't want to be blamed for it. And that's why the war in Ukraine really is a proxy war against Russia. The globals are intending to weaken Russia's conventional military power by using up a lot of their ammunition and, and highlighting their military weaknesses, which the Ukraine war has done. And But conservatives view it as just another one of those illegal interventions for globalist purposes, and it's not. Now, I'm not saying the globalists are good in recognizing that Russia is an existential enemy, so is China. But uh, that's why, why they're doing this, and it's to cover for their own sins, basically, and have, have helped build these countries. So that's why I am, even though both Russia is corrupt and Ukraine, remember in the phony fall of the Soviet Union, the communists never purged any of their communist cadres out of Poland, Hungary, uh, Czechoslovakia, Ukraine. And that's why there's been so much corruption in Ukraine. And that's why, you know, Putin's excuse that he was attacking Ukraine so that it couldn't join NATO rings kind of hollow because by having all those communist spies still in those former Soviet states, when they join NATO, he has an open ear to what NATO is doing. So it's more of a feigned excuse that he fears NATO uh, uh, in this. And all of this came out, uh, or should have come out, in Tucker Carlson's interview with Putin, but he was totally unprepared, I think, to ask the critical questions, which would have exposed uh, Putin's um, excuses for having invaded Ukraine. It seems like what you're saying is really there's no good players here. I think uh, some people want to take one side or the other. They want to root for Ukraine or they want to root for Russia and rooting for Ukraine kind of, or rooting for you know the the West here. Um, but really, there aren't any good players in your view. Conservatives are particularly prone to this. They want to see everything black and white, good or evil. But in this case, we've got three evil predator centers and Every nation in the world is controlled by either the Western globalists, Russia, or China. There aren't any nations in the world that are free from their control. 
although there's more or less control over India, it's kind of between two camps. It used to be an ally of Russia, and now it's fighting against uh, China and um, more allied with the West. But uh, uh, it's probably the exception to the rule. Do you see this then as an escalation towards World War III? And how do you see the next few years playing out in that respect? I don't see it as an escalation of World War III. And I've explained this in the World Affairs Brief numerous times, that Putin cannot nuke the West because he can't occupy. He doesn't have enough troops to barely occupy eastern Ukraine, let alone all of Ukraine, let alone all of Europe, let alone the United States. So if you nuke those countries, it means they just rebuild if you can't occupy and they come back and get you. So you see, Putin has to wait for China to be ready to back him up in an attack on the West. And that's why this whole notion that we're driving Putin into the hands of China by helping Ukraine is just nonsense. They have always been joined at the hip. Russia gave China all of its military technology up until the last decade when they superseded uh, Russia and they've uh, stolen most of the technology they have from the U.S. Uh, in fact, Russia stopped sharing technology with China, not because they aren't in an ally alliance to take down the West, but because they know that China will eventually come back after them once the West is defeated in the next world war. So Ukraine, I don't believe Elijah is the trigger event for World War III. I think it depends on China being ready and we'll only know that if China intends to strike Taiwan and the U.S. chooses to intervene. Now, the U.S. has always had the one China policy, which guarantee or at least told China that we would not interfere if you took Taiwan by force. But Biden messed up a couple of times in public pronouncements saying that the U.S. would defend Taiwan. The first time the White House came out and corrected him and said, no, we believe in the one China policy that Taiwan's part of China. Then Biden did it again, and the White House did not correct Biden. And so that's left China ambivalent, shall we say. They don't know now if the U.S. is going to intervene. I don't think the U.S. did intend to intervene, but I think now they're expected to and they will. Now, to complicate matters, North Korea has threatened that if the U.S. does intervene and try to stop China in an invasion of Taiwan, that they will attack South Korea and U.S. bases, Guam and Hawaii in the, in the Pacific. So now that makes Taiwan a major trigger event for World War III. And why do I say that? Because if South Korea is involved, if North Korea attacks South Korea, we've got 26,000 troops there. So we have to respond to that. We can't let those troops be taken over by North Korea. And so if we go to war with North Korea, they have an ironclad treaty with China that brings China into the war. And that means China will probably have to do a missile preemptive strike on U.S. military bases. And I think that will start World War III. Uh, if you don't mind, Elijah, I want to finish one other thing relative to the Ukraine situation before we move on to that, just because we talked about this. It wouldn't be complete without addressing Tucker Carlson's interview with Putin. And I will have to say that much as I like Tucker Carlson, he was very unprepared for this interview, not knowing the history. And uh, Putin really derailed his entire interview by taking 20, almost a half an hour just to go through ancient history, trying to build the case of Russia's integral relationship with Ukraine how 80% of Ukrainians speak Russian and how they've always been close and this and that, and part of the Soviet Union together. Although Putin, it's interesting, did admit to Tucker Carlson, who didn't even catch the significance of this. He said, he did admit, as I've long published in the World Affairs Brief, that, you, that the Soviets themselves put Eastern Ukraine, the Donbass, and Crimea into the borders of Ukraine that it weren't originally part of Ukraine. So it wasn't the West that put those Russians into Ukraine. It was the Soviets did. Now, Putin would claim, I don't know the reason why Lenin and Stalin did this. Of course, he knows the reason. The reason was they knew, just as Lenin faked peace with the West at some point to get aid and trade, you know, Putin is known for a long time, as Anatoly Golitsyn, the Russian defector, has said in the Pirestroika deception that the Soviets would again pull a peace card with the West by collapsing the Soviet Union. And by putting the Russians into Ukraine, that would give them the excuse, if those Russians were felt persecuted, for them to invade again. And that's exactly what we saw. But one of the problems with 
Tucker, he didn't even have a knowledge of history sufficient to counter Putin's Russian-Ukraine connection to bring up the fact that in 1923, um, or 31 and 32, um, that uh, the Soviets pulled a massive famine in Ukraine by stealing all their food. They collected all the grain, all, all the food. They even went through people's house to house and took all their food out to starve millions of Ukrainians to death. It was one of the greatest Soviet atrocities ever done. And it, it permanently damaged the relationship between Ukrainians and Russians. And that's why there's so much hatred of Russia within Ukraine, even though it was their grandparents who went through that famine, having suffered through that at the hands of Stalin. And Tucker failed to bring that up. You know, what about this? If you think there's such a close relationship, what about the famine where you Russians actually killed millions of Ukrainians? And of course, he failed to bring up the, the you know, Putin claimed that he withdrew from the Kiev when in fact he got driven back into Russia from a failed Ukraine invention. It did a lot of febs in those, those things. But in essence, the point I want to bring out is that Putin, in admitting the first time ever that he's ever admitted this, that the Russian leadership effectively initiated the Soviet collapse, meaning it wasn't spontaneous, we did it on purpose, he put together the narrative that this was done because we wanted to have peace and cooperation with the West. In other words, we were giving up communism. We wanted peace and cooperation. And the West rejected our overtures. That was the entire push of the interview. And it's what Tucker Carlson at the World Government Summit, the World Global Summit in Dubai, just continues to reiterate, much because the mainstream media continues to attack Tucker Carlson as a traitor of furthering Russia propaganda. And he might be furthering Russia propaganda by uncritically repeating what Putin claimed, but he's not a traitor. He simply is unknowledgeable in what's going on. I took last week's World Affairs Brief. I outlined how the proof and the evidence shows that Russia was faking it. They didn't have any intent to cooperate and have peace with the West. They were doing it to get the West to stand down in the arms race, to take a peace dividend, which they did, and started spending billions on social welfare instead of arms, and to give aid and trade to Russia, which they did. We rebuilt their entire oil system in Russia. Western companies did, making it one of the largest oil producers in the world. And we gave them billions of dollars, including suitcases full of $100 bills in cash, which the oligarchs promptly took to Europe. And that's why they only have $100 bills to give us tips. The U.S. was only providing them $100 bills, not 10s and 20s. But the point is, the crucial thing, Putin wouldn't have dared mention that they collapsed the Soviet Union had he told the truth that it was to fool the West into giving us aid and trade and helping us catch up. So we made up the story, we did it for peace and cooperation. And he had several anecdotal stories to back that point of view, such as we offered to Bill Clinton to join NATO, and then his advisors came back and says, no, you can't do that. Well, in fact, the whole purpose of NATO was to protect Europe from Russian aggression. So there is no purpose of NATO if the Russians really collapse the Soviet Union. But I contest by, that our globalist deep state did not believe the Russians, even though they didn't counter them publicly. If I could see all the evidence that it was a phony collapse, they could too. They were still in the mode in those days of Bill Clinton of aiding and covering for the Russians and covering for their deceptions. It wasn't until President Trump that they started to switch sides and start to attack Russia. And that's why they didn't expose the phony fall of the Soviet Union. They kind of played both sides since they were still in the support our future enemy type uh, thing. So that's the big picture on the war in Ukraine. Now, remember, even though I think it's wise for the globalists to damage Russia's conventional military by supporting the war in Ukraine, Ukraine is a corrupt country, still has all those communists still embedded in the bureaucracy. That's why Hunter Biden was able to take those bribes from Burisma and all those, because those are former communists that were making themselves wealthy by being in charge of the gas and oil industry in Ukraine. Um, and... And the U.S. should not be giving any money at all to Ukraine because it all gets squandered. It's all going to 
the oligarchs. It's going to pay the public servants. And we have no business paying their public servants. Um, if it's to the benefit of the U.S. to degrade Russia's conventional weapon as an existential enemy, then fine to give them military capability, but no money because Ukraine is as corrupt as Russia is. Now, when it comes to this Tucker Carlson interview, it seems like the effect, as you mentioned, was a lot of Russian propaganda, but it also exposed some truth, at least in your view, that it was Russia itself that made it appear that the Soviet Union had collapsed, but that wasn't true. So did you want to kind of expand on the fallout from this interview, how it maybe just added a lot of confusion into the mainstream? Um, What is your take on that? You know, the mainstream is just apoplectic about this because, you know, uh, aid to Ukraine has stymied now uh, in in Congress because the Republicans and Trump supporters don't support Ukraine, thinking that anything the globalists do is evil, even though globalists have switched side now and are doing the right thing in contesting an enemy, which they should have contested from the beginning, which they are not. But the confusion is that it's just like an avalanche of support now for Putin. Alex Jones has gone on one rant after another about how wonderful Putin is, how he's against LBGTQ. And put, and, and Tucker in the World Glo- uh, Government Summit even went about talking about the fact that Moscow is a beautiful city and clean and you can ride the subways without uh, the danger of being mugged like you can in Canton, New York or Chicago. But he doesn't understand the reason why. The reason why Putin is not in favor, of course, of the LBGTQ agenda or criminal behavior in that is not because he's moral. I mean, uh, he's assassinated a lot of political opposition. He's killed Berezovsky, poisoned various uh, defectors to the union. Um, He's outlawed various Christian sects that aren't part of the Orthodox Church. He's made himself one of the most wealthy members of the in the world by creating new oligarchs after he killed Berezovsky, who give him about 4% of their take. And that's why that Sochi palace, that gold-plated palace, it does belong to Putin. So he's as corrupt as they come, but Putin and the conservatives have bought into this notion that he claims to be a Christian and because he's against the transgender idiocy in the West. But He fails to realize, or conservatives fail to realize, that Russia wants to militarily take over the West. They don't care a whit about this permissiveness and tolerance in the social woke agenda. They aren't going to tolerate that because they want as strong as nation as possible. They, the conservatives don't really, it's the globalists themselves that want to destroy our morals and our Christian values in here. And that's why they are promoting all of this tolerance of uh, of the woke DEI agenda, et cetera. So that's the real fallout from the interview is that it has reinforced in conservative minds the false notion that the globalist attacking Russia can't be right. Russia has to be a good guy because it's our evil globalists that are attacking him. Well, there are no good global, no good people. The globalists aren't good. Russia's not good. Ukraine's not good. It's a world of evil out there and conservatives have to wake up to understand the complexities of conspiracy that are behind what's going on. And that's what I try to point out in my world affairs brief. Moving now to the border issue, though, your latest thoughts on that and what how it has to do with preparedness right now. Well, the border issue has a lot to do with preparedness because this government is not out of incompetence, as Tucker told the world global government. It's out of a real evil agenda of literally flooding the country. And it's not just with Democratic, future Democratic voters. That was, I think, the original agenda of bringing in a lot of Latino um, who come from socialist countries and more akin to voting Democratic. But in this case, now you're bringing in literally tens of thousands of Chinese single men uh, who are coming through in a pipeline that's funded by China. They bought up a string of hotels from Ecuador through Mexico and given maps to all these Chinese people. And they all come to Ecuador because Ecuador is the only country in Latin America that doesn't have a visa requirement. So anybody literally can fly into Ecuador. And from Ecuador, they are going up and the Chinese are only allowed to stay at those hotels. Nobody else can get a room there. So these Chinese have maps, and although I don't believe in the rumors that this is an invasion force, it would take much more even than 100,000 troops to invade the United States. It takes millions. 
And even then, they would be foolish to try because we have so many arms and private citizens here. But I think they do will provide in the future war scenario a fifth column of saboteurs and other people that can, you know, create some chaos within America. But by far and large, the uh, a growing number is coming from Africa. And these are desperate people, mostly economic refugees. Uh, and from the Middle East, you even have some jihadists coming in. Uh, one particular post on X was about uh, this Muslim leader here who's just got released from jail from doing a terrorist event. Shows up at the U.S. border and the reporter asks him, well, what's your name? Where are you headed? And he says, you'll hear from me soon in the news, meaning I'm going to make some big news. So there could be some future terrorist events uh, coming out of this. Um, as it relates to strategic relocation, the important thing to remember is this. In Friday's World Affairs Brief, I'm going to publish the cell phone map or links to the cell phone map tracking where these people are going. And most of them are going to the East Coast, major big cities, some to California. But they're headed for the major uh, cities in the East. And believe me, they are not going to find the American dream here. They're going to be put into refugee camps, community centers and schools that have been taken over by in Massachusetts and New York and Chicago to house these people. They're going to be kind of kept as you know prisoners, and they're going to be very irate. They're going to be very angry about the American experience. And so when war does come to our shore, which I think will be preceded by an EMP strike when the grid goes down, uh, these people, millions of them, estimated about 8 million in the past uh, three years from uh, Joe Biden being in office, added to the at least 30 to 35 million of illegals already here. And they're mostly peaceful, except for the gang members. The Latinos have integrated well into the workforce, and they're not really the threat. But it is the gang members, the criminals, and the Africans that I really fear the most of getting very disgruntled, whether it's like the Somalis in Minneapolis. This is going to play a very large part. So in strategic relocation, I've always warned about the threat of high population densities. And these refugees are always going to the ghettos of these high population density centers. So no longer, not only is it the number of people per square mile in the East Corridor, high density corridor from Boston down to Washington, D.C., you have a thousand people per square mile, probably more now. But when you intermix these refugee flows into those who are going to start to go berserk uh, without uh, the refugee food and status that they're being given by the American NGOs, which are funded by U.S. taxpayers, I think the amount of pillaging and, and uh, social unrest that's going to go on is going to be amplified significantly. And Texas, unfortunately, is still, even though they ship out a lot of these people, I would say the highest percentage of illegals are still in Texas. And so I'm no longer optimistic about them being able to survive despite a very strong conservative um, half of the people, at least, uh, being able to protect themselves. It's, it's going to be a problem. Now, looking at that, obviously, Texas in, in your book um, was a little bit favorable, but not one of the most favorable st states for strategic relocation. Um, but it seems like maybe it's gone down a notch or so. Can you give us some more updates on strategic relocation and some of the areas that you think are ideal for those looking to relocate um, because of the, <laughs> the unrest that's going on? Well, if you look at the refugee flow maps, very few of these people are going out west. Most of them are going east of the Mississippi. And uh, those states are fairly low, uh, probably going to take down Kentucky and Tennessee a little bit lower because a lot of them are going to Nashville and some of the other areas in Kentucky. And remember that the, the higher the population density on the East Coast, when there's no electricity and they start to spread out into rural areas, they can get even into the rural areas um, of Tennessee and Kentucky, which in the previous editions have been pretty high, highly rated. Um, Vermont uh, or, you know, has been a liberal state. New Hampshire has been kind of an in-between state, which does offer in northern New Hampshire some respite. But now I'm afraid that because of uh, how serious the social unrest is going to be, 
and the woke policies of Massachusetts and uh, Boston in particular, that uh, almost the entire East Coast is going to get overwhelmed with refugees and make it fairly unsafe. Now, aside from California, which is a zero-rated state now because of the policies of Governor Newsom, um, and a lot of people have left California for Utah and Idaho, my two highest-rated state. And what makes them highly rated is they're hundreds and hundreds of miles through trackless desert or through mountains from all the population centers of Oregon, Washington, uh, California, and Colorado. Um, very, very difficult for people to walk through those desert countries across the Nevada deserts to get to those two states. But on the downside, a lot of Californians have moved in and driven up the, the prices of land in Utah and Idaho, Exodus. The, the first state that they've gone to in terms of numbers is Texas, by the way. And a lot of people worry about Californians uh, coming in and bringing their liberal attitudes uh, with them into a conservative state like Texas. And it's very, they certainly have done that in Arizona, for example. Arizona, I expect, uh, is already a secret blue state in the sense that uh, Democrats, by hook or by crook, control all the government powers, including the election machinery. And so I doubt if we'll see Terry Lake win there or other conservatives win back that state, especially with the election fraud that was endemic in Arizona uh, before. Texas is still a, a toss-up state. I think the conservatives have been very energized in Texas because of this border issue. Uh, they're really up in arms about this. Gather, Governor Abbott, I don't really trust. I think he's a true rhino Republican, but he's playing to the conservatives knowing that they're very energized and he doesn't dare go against them. But as I pointed out in one of the recent World Affairs brief. There's a lot of holes in the fence around Eagle Pass. You know, people can just still walk right through, even with the National Guard there. They aren't, they've got open gates in the middle Trump wall. I mean, just always permanently open. And so I'm not sure how serious Abbott is about stopping the influx. But time will tell. But this much I can say, what Mayorkas and his impeachment has basically said is, look, if you impeach me, you're going to get somebody even worse. As long as this Biden administration is in power, I don't think we're ever going to see the border closed. I think it's just going to be wide open, massive entrance into this country. And boy, there's a limit to what it can tolerate. Even the sanctuary blue states are complaining now that they can't handle all the influx of people coming and they're desperate for federal aid, which the Biden administration is going to give out uh, to them. And I'm just not sure that uh, Trump could stop it, even if he, uh, I know he could return to the return in, to Mexico policy and the Border Patrol would fully support that. But you know, last time Trump was in power, you know who stopped him from building the border wall? It was Paul Ryan and the Republicans. In other words, you get a Rhino Republican in the Speaker of the House and Trump's agenda was dead during that period of time. So the deep state really has more control than we think over the Republican Party, not the grassroots Republicans, but at the very top. Now, coming full circle here, looking back at the potential for a World War Three, what are some of the considerations that people should be looking at when considering strategic relocation? And has that changed? I know we've talked about this before um, with you on the channel, but has that changed since the last time we had you on in any significant way? Well, one of the most important things for them, to, for you know, your finance people to realize is get out of cryptos. This war will be preceded by a few minutes with a nuclear EMP strike, which will take down the grid. And with the grid going down, the internet is down. And when the internet's down, you can't access your cryptos. And that's one of the reasons why I've said I don't believe the government will ever institute central bank digital currency at the exclusion of cash. I think it will run concurrently. In fact, we have digital banking already. All your bank accounts are digital, and uh, uh, you know very few people even get paper statements anymore, which is unwise. You need paper statements to prove what was in the account when the grid goes down. Uh, but it, it's important to realize that even the elite will need cash when an EMP strike comes, and uh, they can't access their bank accounts either. Uh, so I think cash will be king at the immediacy of war or a grid down situation until it runs out. And then barter starts. 
Uh, gold and silver, uh, I don't think gold is very useful except for huge ransom purchases or buying your way out of something. Because how do you get change for a $2,000 gold coin if you're trying to get a loaf of bread or something? Silver eagles, that is silver dollars, I think, are the best potential barter coin, although fewer and few people recognize the silver dollar. My brother, the economist, gives out silver dollars as tips. And more often than not, he has a guy say to him, what is this man you know, that you've just given me? Don't, doesn't recognize a silver dollar. So let alone that it's worth 30 paper dollars or 36, you know, just hard to convince people of the value when they're not used to dealing with those things. So what I recommend to people is that you stockpile, 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 because if you stockpile all the things you normally use in life, then you reduce your future need for money, at least in the immediacy of the future crisis, which will be the worst and the panic ensues. You don't want to have to be standing in line at a store that's being stripped clean of its goods trying to uh, remedy your lack of stockpile. That's very good to know. And yeah, I mean, stockpiling is a really good thing, especially if you're going to use it anyways. Why not just buy a little bit more of all the non-perishable stuff you, you use, right? I think that's very good advice there. You've talked before on the show about um, also having a uh, a bunker. Uh, your perspective on that, because I know a lot of our viewers um, watching probably aren't going to be building a bunker in uh, in their house. It's definitely a feasible thing they can do, and they can definitely look at our previous interviews to understand how to do that. But are there alternatives in your view or more safe locations maybe if people aren't looking to go down that route? There are none, Elijah. And we don't use the B word, by the way, because that triggers NSA putting you on a list. We call it a safe room or a shelter. But there are no alternatives to what a shelter can do that is concealed and below ground. And I'll tell you why. Let's suppose that you have enough money to have a retreat. You have to stay in Houston or you have to stay in the Chicago area, but you have enough money to get a retreat out in the hinterland. Well, the hinterland is not exactly safe because, you know, hunters are out there and sometimes people can break into things. So you have to be sure if you're going to develop a retreat and stockpile it with all the things that you're going to need for six months or a year, that it's still there when you get there. And the only way to do that is to have a concealed safe room. Uh, if you're going to build a cabin out in the mountains, put a whole basement below with a concrete ceiling on it and com completely conceal it so there's no view, no windows. doesn't look like there's a basement at all. That's the best concealment there is. Or if you're going to add on to an existing house, add on to your garage and put it below a garage slab because nobody expects a basement to be below a garage. Those are kind of hints. But remember, when there's a mob of refugees coming down the street toward your house and they're going house to house, pillaging everything in the house, you're not going to start shooting people who are just starving to death. You've got to be able to get out of the way. I can tell you there is nothing that substitutes for that. I want to repeat, nothing substitutes for a safe room that you can get out of the way where people can't find you and can't get to you. You talk about, well, I've got a retreat. I can get out of town. How do you get out of town when the streets are jammed, when there's no fuel? And uh, are you going to walk? Are you going to, what are you going to do with people accosting you and trying to steal what you have? And how much can you carry when you're walking? Once again, I repeat, there is no substitute for having a basement concealed safe room whether it's for your stockpiling, whether it's for your weapons that you might have for self-defense, and whether it's concealing yourself and your family so that you don't have to confront the social unrest. I can't emphasize that enough. And I realize there's resistance to this, Elijah. I know people, and that's why people are so desperate to have Trump elected. They want a savior who's going to save us so they don't have to prepare. They don't want to have to go through the expense of building a safe room or putting in solar or a diesel generator, you know, to provide electricity. But let me tell you, there's no safety, not even Donald Trump. He wasn't able to drain the swamp. He doesn't know conspiracy. He won't be able to drain the swamp the next time, even if he gets elected. Things will be better. He'll postpone things. But remember, he thinks that he can stop the war on Ukraine just by telephoning Putin. He doesn't understand that Putin is really evil. He brags about 
all these leaders being basically good guys that I'm so great that they'll just acquiesce to what I want. I mean, remember when he said, I'm going to go to North Korea and either by diplomatic means or by military means, I'm going to stop his nuclear program. He got to North Korea and Kim Jong-un turned on the charm offensive and Putin or Trump walked away thinking that Kim Jong-un was his best friend and said that for years. He's still a good friend. I trust Kim Jong-un. Well, that's how how bad Donald Trump is about judging the character of our enemies. So remember, no one's going to save us. We need to prepare ourselves, both financially and stockpiling wise for the wars that are coming. That's my message. Well, Joel, we really appreciate your time today. If our viewers are interested in learning more about the safe room uh, that you talk about, we'll put a link in the description to resources there. Also, uh, in, in, in I believe a few interviews we did with you, we discussed building a safe room. So we'll put a link to that in the description there. Your website, uh, joelscousin.com. Where can they find, uh, what can they find there? And tell us a bit about your world affairs brief. Well, joelscousin.com has all of my books listed there. There are three books there, the Strategic Relocation, North American Guide to Safe Places, which is the only book dealing with relocation for security. Then there's the Secure Home, which is 700 pages, everything about preparedness, including high security construction and retreats. Um, It's for new construction and remodeling. But the third book, the High Security Shelter book, is specifically about building a safe room in an existing basement, which for most people is by far the cheapest alternative. Now, World Affairs Brief is at worldaffairsbrief.com, and people can get a free sample issue by clicking on Request a Sample in red on the left, and you get the current brief. The World Affairs Brief is my take on World Affairs uh, every single week from a, frankly, a conspiratorial perspective, that is what the deep state or what secret combinations of power are doing behind the scenes. Um, And I analyzed the Tucker Carlson and Putin interview from what was going on in Ukraine and what Putin didn't say. And I'm amplifying that on this week's brief. We're talking about the specific errors that Putin made in his constructing a selective view of history, which people need to understand so that they understand that he's he's basically fibbing about uh, the reasons he went into Ukraine and the relationship with Ukraine. Fantastic. I know looking through uh, strategic relocation here, it is quite extensive. It goes into every single state and pretty much every single area in every single state. So I uh, definitely recommend our viewers to uh, ch- take a look at that. Joel, thank you so much for your time today and God bless. My pleasure, Elijah. Good to be with you. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for February 12th through February 19th, 2024, while supplies last. First, we feature backdated one ounce silver philharmonics at $3.15 over spot with a minimum order of 50. We also have pre-1933 gold $10 and $20 Liberties at $99 over melt and $145 over melt respectively. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, Call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you.